Item number, SCP-640, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-640 is to be kept inside an ellipsoidal room with a uniformly reflective interior, such as nickel or chromium plating. The atmosphere in the room must be maintained at a temperature of between 260 and 307 Kelvin, at a relative humidity of 50% or less. Temperatures and humidities outside these limits greatly increase the entity's appetite and aggression, and will likely result in personnel casualties. The containment chamber must be equipped with a light-tight airlock fitting, equipped with an electronic interlock, to prevent both doors from being simultaneously opened. Though SCP-640 is not known to be able to assume a gaseous form, these doors should be airtight and, if possible, watertight to facilitate emergency containment measures. All personnel entering the containment facility must wear reflective suits, including anti-IR face shields. Exposure time shall be limited to no more than 30 minutes without O5 level consent. All personnel shall receive a dose of amphetamine, modafinil, or caffeine prior to exposure. Resistance, intolerance, or allergy to these drugs is an absolute contradiction to assignment to the SCP-640 study team. Description SCP-640 is a free-roaming sentient electromagnetic phenomenon, typically manifesting as several roughly circular spots of yellow-orange light, between 18 and 57 millimeters in diameter, depending on the entity's current appetite and energy level. It has also been observed to manifest as spots of infrared and EHF radiation, and seems capable of rapidly varying its wavelength. In all known instances, SCP-640 has disguised itself as spots of sunlight shining on a wall, typically inside a child's room. It generally fades from view, presumably by shifting into the IR or RF range, when closely investigated. SCP-640 is carnivorous. While it is capable of deriving sustenance from all known Earth animals, SCP-640 shows a marked preference for humans and apes, especially children. It consumes its prey by inflicting burns of varying severity and depth. For as yet unknown reasons, SCP-640 tends to target the face, legs, and forearms of its prey. It also often feeds on the same prey repeatedly allowing it time to heal between attacks. The entity prefers to attack sleeping prey, though if angry, hungry, or frightened, it will not hesitate to attack prey while awake. When it wishes, it can inflict fatal burn injuries to an adult human in approximately 120 seconds. An attempt to destroy SCP-640 using a reflective room and a 25 GCD flash lamp has failed. However, Testing revealed that a reflective room is effective in disrupting the entity's feeding. As multiple specimens of SCP-640 have surfaced, an effective means of neutralization is being sought. The Foundation does not currently believe it necessary to contain more than a few specimens, in light of the resources required. Recovery Notes The first SCP-640 specimen was recovered from the home of Japan in 1984 after both his children were admitted to a local hospital with severe burn injuries. The Foundation was alerted by an anonymous source, believed to be working for Foundation agents discovered the entity after several weeks of probing, during which time one of the children was killed by the entity. Agents managed to capture it using data expunged, and transported it to Site-17 for containment. A second specimen was recovered in the United States in 1999, and another in 2006, both in the same neighborhood. Addendum 640-A Reports from Australia suggest there is at least one SCP-640 specimen in the wild somewhere in and likely another in Agents are currently attempting to locate and contain the entities. Addendum 640-B In two separate incidents, SCP-640 has been observed to distract researchers, causing them to have accidents resulting in breach of suit integrity. Following suit breach, both researchers were fatally attacked by SCP-640. 
Research team lead has recommended that SCP-640 be provisionally assigned Keter classification, pending further investigation to determine whether the entity's actions were deliberate or fortuitous. Addendum 640C Provisional Keter classification denied. Object has been returned to Euclid classification. Item number SCP-641 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures When not in use by researchers or containment teams, the doll is to be stored under lock and key in an on-site safety deposit box. The box should be lined with felt and filled with packing materials in order to ensure its safety. Description SCP-641 is a seemingly ordinary set of Russian Matryoshka dolls, but each layer is improbably thin. 1,347 layers of the doll were measured and demonstrated a mean thickness of 0.04 micrometers, with a standard deviation of 0.02 micrometers. If the disassembled dolls are left untouched for a length of time, ranging from 5 to 7 minutes, the dolls will animate and begin to reassemble, the largest doll leaping over the next largest until the doll is assembled at an extremely rapid rate. The longest time this phenomenon has been observed is 3 minutes and 46 seconds, the doll reassembling itself from 3,228 separate pieces. Subjects disassembling the dolls showed a marked aversion to leaving the dolls alone, and if compelled to do so, will become angry, physically fighting any restraints, until the dolls begin to reassemble, at which point, attempts to reach the dolls cease, and the subject typically turns on those responsible for restraints, shouting obscenities until tranquilized. Subjects utilizing the dolls show a single-minded interest in disassembly, and will not be distracted without an interruption of significant magnitude, threatening the subject's safety or health. Afterwards, the subjects recall disassembling SCP-641, but exhibit nothing more than mild annoyance at most. Document 641-1 This document is the transcript of Dr. Frederick Hayden's comments upon utilization of the object. Dr. Hayden, Experiment 641-1 I will attempt to disassemble SCP-641 and record at five-minute intervals. Guards are posted at the doors and I am unarmed, in case I become unmanageable. Dr. Hayden, five minutes, three seconds. I have removed 32 layers. I am proceeding slowly, specifically, despite my urge to move rapidly. Time passes. Dr. Hayden, nine minutes, 59 seconds. 68 layers removed. The urge is growing stronger. I really want to see what's in the middle of this thing. Time passes. Dr. Hayden. 16 minutes, 23 seconds. 483 layers removed. This is more fun than I gave it credit for at first. Wasn't paying attention to the stopwatch. I'll correct that for the next report at 20 minutes. Time passes. Guard. Dr. Hayden. Don't you need to make a rep- Dr. Hayden. Shut up! Wait. Shit. Uh, 45 minutes, 23 seconds. Oh, man. Terminating experiment. I may be compromised by SCP-641. Sounds of a chair scuffling. Stevens, replace the object in its holding container. I'm going to psych for an evaluation. Sounds of a chair scuffing the floor, then footsteps. Note. Dr. Hayden has demonstrated an aversion to contact with SCP-641 after the incident documented, and his psychological profile demonstrated no dangerous tendencies. After a month, he was placed back on duty as head of research for SCP-641. Addendum. The object is under no circumstances to be used for personal amusement or recreation. Any personnel seen improperly utilizing SCP-641 will be reprimanded and a note placed on their personnel file pending transfer to another project. Any experiments with the object are to be performed with D-Class personnel, whose medical history shows no alcohol or narcotics abuse, and whose psychological profile shows no predilection to addiction. If the object needs to be neutralized to prevent capture, current research indicates that a hammer or tightly closed fist will do. Notes 
This object shows potential in pacification of dangerous humanoid SCPs. Research into how the effect is achieved will continue. Any field teams requesting access to SCP-641 may submit a request directly to me. Please include a description of who will be accessing the device and notations of their trustworthiness. If it is broken, you will have me to answer to. Dr. Frederick Hayden. Item number SCP-668 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Revised As of data expunged, no special containment procedures, aside from standard security, are required. SCP-668 is to be transferred to a locked safe deposit box at Site-19's high-value item storage facility. Standard defenses against intrusion, explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic are to be in place at all times, according to standard operating procedure. SCP-668 may only be removed from its safe deposit box by personnel with security clearance 2 or higher. Individuals wishing to make use of SCP-668 outside Site-19 must first submit a Form 668 Requested Course of Action Form 20511 and be fitted with an explosive kill switch collar on a 24-hour timer before taking SCP-668 into the field. An auditing officer with security clearance 4 or higher must confirm that SCP-668 has been returned to its safe deposit box before the collar is deactivated. Description SCP-668 is a 33cm or 13-inch chef's knife with a rosewood handle and full tang construction, crafted at some point from the late 1930s to the early 1940s. When first acquired by field operatives, SCP-668 was in badly rusted condition, with heavy pitting from blood stains and other bodily fluids trapped in micro crevices within the blade. Following thorough analysis, these irregularities were removed for aesthetic purposes. This has had negligible, if any, effect on SCP-668's special properties. The first recorded appearance of SCP-668 was in the 1960s, during the infamous Data Expunged case. Data Expunged, a New York woman living alone, was allegedly raped and murdered by subject Data Expunged. Despite the fact that 38 witnesses reported hearing the attack, none of them attempted to aid the young woman for over six hours until her eventual death. Whether the item received its properties due to this event, or whether it had them beforehand, is a matter of debate. See Dr. R's paper regarding the bystander effect versus Dr. R's theory regarding psychic imprintation. What is clear, however, is its current properties. When carried by a human or humanoid entity with violent intent towards another human or humanoid entity, SCP-668 broadcasts a psychic signal that renders all sentient beings with a psionic resistance index of 97 or lower incapable of assisting the victim. Affected entities report a sudden sense of apathy while under SCP-668's influence. Sensory input is not affected, and affected entities report feeling revulsion and horror, but are simply incapable of acting, even indirectly, to assist the victim. Meanwhile, it renders the victim incapable of defending themselves against their attacker. Tests using Class D personnel have shown no upper limit in the number of entities affected by the psychic resonance. In one test, 12 Class D personnel due for first-of-the-month termination were placed in a room alongside a researcher who was told to randomly select one test subject for death. The researcher killed all test subjects one by one, despite their professed horror. Prior incidents have indicated the possibility of hundreds, if not thousands of deaths, due to SCP-668's unique properties. See Incident Report 668-A regarding Mall Massacre and subsequent information blackout operations. Recovery of SCP-668 in such scenarios is problematic due to the item's psychic properties. Agents attempting to apprehend the subject during containment failure incidents are often themselves affected by SCP-668's so-called apathy field, resulting in casualties among Foundation personnel. 
Following Incident 668A, standard retrieval protocol includes the use of a long-range sniper rifle, double-blind conditions, and three different agents working in tandem through carefully coordinated actions to prevent any of them realizing that they are actively opposing the subject. Because of the obvious apocalyptic possibilities, it is the recommendation of this panel that SCP-668 be designated a Keter-level threat and placed in high-level confinement. Incident Retrieval of SCP-668 13-inch chef's knife SCP involved SCP-668 Personnel involved Data expunged Date Location Description On date expunged City Police Department Precinct Responded to reports of a man attacking and killing bystanders with a large chef's knife at a local mall. Upon responding, officers discovered 15 casualties, most of whom had been ritually flensed in a manner described by witnesses as horrific. Officers discovered the suspect, an escaped serial killer named henceforth referred to as Suspect, in the child's daycare area, in the process of filleting and consuming a nine-year-old boy. Officers ordered Suspect to cease and desist. Suspect did not comply. Officers then attempted to fire upon Suspect, but discovered that they were unable to pull the trigger. Officers then attempted to flee, but found themselves unable to do so, after Suspect declared his intention to quote, Murder every last one of you mother pigs. End quote. Suspect then proceeded to data expunged, ending with Cynthia Wallace, a Foundation operative embedded as an observer with the PD. Despite being under severe psychic assault, Officer Wallace, a pseudonym, managed to activate her emergency transponder located in her belt while complying with Suspect's orders to alerting the Foundation of the situation. Mobile Task Force Pi-1, City Slickers, arrived on the scene minutes later, disguised as an FBI Special Anti-Terrorist Task Force. Pi-1 breached the perimeter at corresponding with the moment that Officer Wallace's vital signs telemetry ceased transmitting. Task Force members discovered suspects standing outside the department store on the third floor of the mall. The police officers' bodies were found suspended from the third floor railing skin flensed and arranged in the form of wings, entrails removed and trailing to the floor. Officer Wallace's body was found data expunged. SCP operatives then attempted to terminate suspect, only to discover that they too were unable to fire their weapons. Team leader transmitted a Class 1 Type 73 memetic attack alert to command and ordered the team to withdraw. This order failed when Suspect stated his intention to, quote, find out what all your insides look like, end quote, rendering them helpless to escape. Involved task force members were subsequently remote terminated, using surgically installed cranial detonators, according to standard field protocol following psychic compromise in a field agent. Command elements then authorized escalation of force to Tier 2, severe collateral damage. Aerial bombardment was attempted, but failed when the pilots were unable to release their payload over the target. It was thus determined that the psychic field that prevents hostile intent towards subject may have an infinite range. Escalation of force to Tier 3 was considered, but delayed while Dr. Gears suggested an alternative strategy, with a higher chance to retrieve the item intact. Hypothesizing that hostile intent was required for the psychic controls to trigger, Dr. Gears suggested using Class D personnel under mind control by SCP-61. Previously prepped sleepwalker agents fitted with surgically implanted earpieces transmitting SCP-61 were given the following commands. D-6156 was ordered to give the following commands to the rest of the personnel through radio control. D-6156 was not given any indication as to the reason for said commands to prevent the psychic defenses from triggering. Agents were able to order D-6156 to give the following orders, suggesting that the psychic defense may only be able to function through a certain number of iterations. 
More research is required on this issue. D-6159 through 70, 12 personnel were ordered to carry explosive charges to 12 predetermined points, opening gas mains along the way. Explosives were detonated in sequence upon being given the final order by D-6156. D-6199, who fit the profile of the subject's preferred type of victim, was ordered to move to a predetermined location at the center of the mall to lure the suspect to the best location for both ensuring a kill and allowing for easy retrieval of the remains. Finally, six D-Class personnel not under control by SCP-61 were ordered to capture the subject. These Class D personnel were not expected to complete their mission and served as a delaying action while the mind-controlled operatives carried out their mission. The operation was a success. By utilizing multiple personnel, none of whom were aware of the significance of their actions, none of the personnel knew that their actions were related to terminating the suspect and were thus able to act freely. Suspect's remains were retrieved from the rubble by a bomb-defusing robot and placed in a box lined with SCP-148 before being retrieved by Foundation personnel. Following confirmation of capture, Command ordered Tier 3, Nuclear Detonation, elements to stand down from Ready-5 status and declared the incident contained. A cover story blaming the attack on terrorists was formulated and disseminated to the public. Controlled testing has determined that the suspect's weapon, 13-inch chef's knife, was the active agent in the incident, emitting a psionic command that data expunged. Suspect's remains are to be sent to PD, along with a replica knife. The original weapon is to be designated a Keter-level SCP, SCP-668, and sent to Site-19 for further testing. How the suspect acquired SCP-668 is unknown at this time. It is further noted that the obsessive nature of the subject's method of killing may have contributed to the success of this operation. Subject carried out its killings in a ritualistic manner, maximizing the amount of horror, pain, and suffering inflicted on its victims. For this reason, Foundation personnel were able to keep him contained within an enclosed area the mall, and formulate a plan of action. Should the subject have made the decision to leave the mall and continue its killing spree elsewhere, immediate Tier 3 response by a double-blind operator would have been the only possible method of containing the incident. End Incident Log Addendum 668A Following further testing, it has been determined that the test subjects wielding SCP-668 can be terminated through passive response so long as the terminating agent is introduced before the subject takes possession of SCP-668. The Running Man Protocol is hereby approved for use with SCP-668, and the item in question is hereby reclassified as a Euclid-type object. Addendum 668-B With the ending of the Omega-7 project, no further attempts to weaponize SCP-762 or SCP-668 are to be attempted. Addendum 668-C With the ending of the Omega-7 project, no further attempts to weaponize SCP-682 or SCP-668 are to be attempted. Addendum 668-D Request to reclassify SCP-668 under its original designation as a Keter-class object under review. Addendum 668-E Request to reclassify SCP-668 under its original designation as a Keter-class object, denied. SCP-668 will remain at Euclid classification. Item Number SCP-679 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Samples of SCP-679 should be contained in sealed glass vials with the temperature kept at 25 degrees Celsius. Infected subjects should be kept restrained in a sterile environment. All personnel handling samples or subjects should wear Class A hazmat suits. Any material or infected subjects removed from containment should be incinerated immediately. To 
prevent potential cross-contamination. At no point should samples of SCP-679 and SCP-1077 be stored at the same facility. Description SCP-679 is a fungal infection of a previously unknown Aspergillus species. It was discovered among the local homeless population in Florida. It is highly infectious through direct contact with the fungus, though other means of transmission have not been ruled out. In early stages, subjects complain of entoptic phenomena. Subjects report seeing tiny bright dots moving rapidly in their field of vision. This is especially prevalent when sneezing or looking into strong blue light. After approximately one week from initial exposure, the sclera turns black. The subject loses vision at this time, becoming entirely blind. Within a day of this, small ulcerations appear in the corners of the eyes. This causes the vitreous humor to begin leaking out, having the appearance of thick, black tears. Mycelia are also pushed through the ulcerations. Each mycelium resembles a thin white thread coated with slime, reaching as long as 25 centimeters. As the ulcerations widen and more of the humor leaks out, more mycelia appear. At this stage, the eye begins to rot entirely, a process sped up by the fungus. However, it seems to protect the rest of the eye socket and the nerve preventing infection by other pathogens in 80 to 90% of test subjects. By the time the eyes have gone entirely, the sockets are filled with the fungus, with a thick mass of mycelia hanging from the empty sockets. This process takes approximately two weeks from the time the ulcerations appear. Once the eyes are completely gone, mycelia invade the sinuses, where they trigger increased mucus production which the fungus appear to feed upon. At this stage, the fungus becomes mobile, the individual threads gaining motility. They move around the subject's face in seemingly random patterns. Once the fungus begins moving on its own, subjects report their vision returning. The fungus appear to have photosensitive cells, as well as a currently poorly understood ability to interface with the optic nerve. Subjects describe normal, and in some cases improved, eyesight, except for a much wider field of vision. However, whenever a human with apparently normal eyes enters their field of vision, subjects experience visual hallucinations, fires, dangerous animals, sudden tilts in the floor that seem designed to drive them in the direction of the uninfected. Once they are in range, the mycelia reach out to touch the uninfected human's eyes. This appears to be a reproductive strategy for the fungus. Curing the condition has so far been possible only in the earliest stages of infection. Once the sclera changes, the only treatment is surgical intervention and cauterization of all tissue in the socket and sinuses. Additional test subjects to explore the life cycle and reproduction of SCP-679 are requested. Item Number SCP-690 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-690 is to be stored in a refrigerated locked container in Sector 7 Euclid SCP Containment with a temperature no greater than 10 degrees Celsius. Access to SCP-690 is restricted to personnel with Level 2 access or higher. Experiments involving SCP-690 must be approved by an individual holding Level 4 clearance before testing commences. Personnel with any cuts, scratches, or other injuries of the skin are to be restricted from access to SCP-690. If any unauthorized personnel use a bandage from SCP-690, security personnel are to be called immediately to subdue the offending personnel, and then remove and dispose of the bandage's biological waste. Description SCP-690 appears to be a standard box of commercially available adhesive bandages, now containing 47 bandages. The logo on the box states that its contents are anti-bandages. Box of 64, 
for the practical joker, and that they are supplied by your friends at the factory. When a bandage from SCP-690 is applied to a wound, it will prevent the wound from healing naturally, aggravating the wound and causing infection. Analysis of the bandages has revealed that this is not the result of anomalous properties. The bandages are composed of asbestos and fiberglass, and impregnated with microcapsules, which dissolve upon exposure to body heat. These microcapsules contain a mixture of highly concentrated anticoagulants, heparin, iridin, brodifalcoum, and particularly virulent, but not anomalous, strains of streptococcus, yersinia, staphylococcus, and clostridium. The anomalous property of SCP-690 is that they impose a moderate compulsion on nearby injured humans to take a bandage and apply it to their wound, regardless of the wound's severity. Furthermore, once the bandage is applied, the affected user will believe that the bandage is helping heal their wound and will refuse to remove it. The compulsion is not strong enough to provoke violence. However, Affected personnel have been quite persistent in their efforts to use or keep using SCP-690. Addendum When first discovered, SCP-690 contained 64 bandages. Following containment, 17 bandages have been removed and used for experimental purposes. Forward Subject D received a paper cut on his index finger while reviewing his orientation leaflet. Subject was given one strip of SCP-690 and quickly applied it to his finger. Every five minutes, Subject was questioned about his injury and the strip temporarily removed to observe any physical changes. Time applied. Five minutes. Notable actions. Subject was asked how his finger felt. Subject stated it felt just fine and thanked the observer. Physical examination. Subject's wound failed to close, causing an abnormal loss of blood for a wound of such nature. Time applied. 10 minutes. Notable actions. Subject was asked if he had noticed any changes. Subject claimed to feel better. Physical examination. Slight redness and irritation around the area where SCP-690 was applied. Time applied. 15 minutes. Notable actions. Subject was noted to continuously scratch the area around SCP-690. When questioned about the itching, subject responded with, It's part of the healing process. Physical examination. Skin began to raise up around the wound. Subject began to show the first symptoms of a staph infection. Time applied. 20 minutes. Notable actions. Subject was alerted that he may be suffering from a staph infection. Subject simply ignored the observers. Physical examination. Subject's finger continued to swell, and a small amount of pus began to leak from the wound. Subject seemed irritated when taking off the strip. Time applied. 25 minutes. Notable actions. Subject was offered medical attention for his wound. Subject denied, and... Again, claimed he was just fine. Physical examination. Subject began to secrete fluids from the wound, which leaked through the strip. Swelling noted to accelerate. Time applied. 30 minutes. Notable actions. Subject began to become distressed due to his constant observation. Requested to be alone. Denied. Physical examination. Swelling and moisture on subject's skin caused the strip of SCP-690 to fall off. The strip was reapplied, and subject's finger was wrapped with gauze. Time applied. 35 minutes. Notable actions. Subject was asked to take the bandage off, to which he refused. Observers alerted subject that he would be terminated if he did not comply. Subject continued to refuse. An observer had to take the bandage off, and was met with little resistance. Testing concluded. Physical examination. N.A. Post-experiment. Subject asked for another bandage, before termination. Item number. SCP-691. Object class. 
Euclid. Reclassification to safe pending confirmation from Foundation Intelligence that... Special Containment Procedures. One instance of SCP-691, SCP-6910, is to be stored in a safety deposit box within the Foundation archives. At site... Any other instances are to be destroyed following confirmation that they are identical to SCP-6910. Access is restricted to Dr. and her research assistants. Following incident SCP-691-I-1, second-hand recordings of SCP-691 are prohibited, unless permission is granted from a member of staff with Level 5 clearance. Please see investigation logs for details of standard experimental procedure with respect to any instance of SCP-691. Description there are currently 15 identical instances of SCP-691 that are or have been under Foundation control. SCP-691 is a plain blue cassette tape, on which is printed, Pure Escapism, Limited Edition, one of only 250. One side of the tape contains a short foreword by an unknown male, introducing a piece of music. See addendum SCP-691-A1 for further details. On the opposite side, Aquarela do Brasil, using S.K. Russell's English lyrics, can be heard. This particular version is played by a modern symphony orchestra with an unidentified lyric tenor providing the vocals. It should be noted that the foreword will always be played first, regardless of which side of the tape is entered into a player and both pieces will always be played from the beginning. The foreword is harmless, and has yet to be linked to any of the effects of SCP-691, aside from encouraging the listener to turn the tape over. Subjects listening to the musical piece have reported visual, auditory, and tactile hallucinations, along with a sense of relaxation and well-being. However, it is unclear whether this is due to the nature of the hallucinations, or if it is one of the tape's cognitive effects. Hallucinations have always been described as benign by listeners, and have not been cited as a direct cause of any psychological trauma. Even though hallucinations vary, they have shown some consistency for repeat listeners. Subjects allowed free access to SCP-691 will eventually become capable of doing little more than listening to the tape repeatedly. In several extreme cases, foregoing food and drink to do so. Regular listeners who are denied access will not show traditional withdrawal symptoms. Instead, they will show difficulty in acknowledging visual and oral stimuli. In a few cases, subjects have either refused to or been unable to acknowledge any external stimulus. Addendum SCP-691-A1 Transcript of SCP-691's foreword. Hi there. If you're listening to this, then I can assume that life has got the better of you. Things didn't work out the way you wanted them to, did they? Sometimes it's bad luck. Sometimes you're the cause of your own ruin. Or maybe it's just that you're going nowhere. I'm not one to judge. Everybody has regrets. It's perfectly normal. You don't have to lie to yourself. But I'm digressing, so I'll get to the point. I've got some good news for you, sir or madam. I can offer you a way out. No, 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 no! It's not suicide. You and I both know you don't have the stomach for that unpleasantness. I'm offering you something so much better besides. All you have to do is flip this tape over, close your eyes, and relax. Think of somewhere nice. Think of the good times. Think of those things you always wanted to do. Now, I can't promise that I can give you these, but what I can promise is this. On the other side of this tape, you will find an escape from your own personal train wreck. Enjoy. Addendum SCP-691-A2 All further study on SCP-691 is to be focused on identifying traits associated with its use. As per Dr. Wren's instructions, a request has also been made to study the effects of secondhand recordings of SCP-6910 at various volumes. Approval pending. 
Foundation Intelligence and a detachment of MTF Alpha 2 are working to identify and retrieve any other instances of SCP-691 that may be available to the general public. Incident SCP-691-I-1 Persons involved Dr. Profile Dr. was a reliable and conscientious Foundation employee. His work on SCP and SCP has been of great use to the Foundation. Testimony from Dr. Rupp's wife revealed that Dr. Rupp was in substantial financial difficulty around the time of the incident. Although it is uncertain whether or not this was a contributing factor to SCP 691 I 1. Report 05 2000 1325 hours. Dr. Rupp enters the cell of subject D 691 25 and begins SCP-691 INV-30. 1331 hours. Dr. concludes his investigation, and D-691-25 is removed from cell for termination. Dr. reviews dictaphone and transcribes recording. 1335 hours. Data expunged. 1403 hours. Security footage shows Dr. exiting site Gatehouse Security reports that Dr. cited a personal errand as his reason for leaving. 1415 hours. SCP-6910 is reported missing by Site Security. Security footage is reviewed and a retrieval team is scrambled to Dr. Rupp's home in accordance with Foundation Missing Object Policy. 1435 hours. Retrieval team finds no trace of Dr. Rupp despite a thorough search of his home and the surrounding area. 1600 hours. Dr. Rupp's credit card statement shows that he bought a personal cassette player from a second-hand shop in at around this time. 06 2000 0930 hours. Dr. Rupp is reported as a missing person by his wife. Local police department are authorized to conduct a search under Foundation Supervision. Standard cover story 12 2000 1722 hours. Dr. Rupp's body is found near SCP-6910 is recovered. Responsibility for SCP-6910 is given to Dr. Afterward, Postmortem showed that the probable cause of Dr. Rupp's death was hypothermia brought about by exposure. The body was found with a personal cassette player containing SCP-6910. The Foundation leaked standard cover story and the local coroner's court returned a verdict of accidental death as a direct result of this, citing Dr. Rupp's quote, fragile emotional state, end quote, as an exacerbating factor. Agent R's report stated that Dr. Rupp's death was an indirect result of data expunged. The report did, however, mention that Agent R believed that Dr. Rupp's life could have been saved if he had less knowledge of Foundation Missing Object Policy and suggested a review of non-classified information for non-security personnel. All three of Dr. Rupp's research assistants have since been subjected to full psychological evaluations and have been transferred to projects where cognito hazards and percepto hazards are not involved. SCP-691 Investigation Logs Standard procedure for investigations involving SCP-691 is as follows. Subjects allowed free access to SCP-6910 are to be provided with a soundproof, fully furnished cell. Foundation staff entering testing cell are to wear ear defenders. Subjects listening to SCP-6910 under a member of staff's supervision are to do so through headphones. All prompts from Foundation staff should be non-verbal. NB Following incident SCP-691-I-1, Foundation staff must wear ear protection when any instance of SCP-691 is being played, regardless of the circumstances. Sound recording equipment must not be operated whilst any instance of SCP-691 is playing and only written accounts from test subjects are permitted. SCP-691-INV-1 Date 
Expunged. Time, 1025. Subject, D-691-1. Procedure. Standard experimental procedure followed. D-1 was to listen to both sides of SCP-691 in their entirety, and was to give a verbal account of their experience. Report. D-1 reports nothing unusual whilst listening to SCP-6910's foreword. Whilst listening to the reverse of SCP-6910, D-1 describes how the colors of the room have become more vivid and likens Dr. to something like out of a cartoon. D-1 reports a feeling of complete peace. Subject appeared to take great pleasure in how Dr. was always smiling, although Dr. reports that this was not the case. D-1 requested further access to SCP-691. Request was denied. SCP-691 INV-10 Date Expunged Time 0951 Subject D-6917 Procedure Standard experimental procedure was followed. D-7 was allowed free, undisturbed access to SCP-6910. D-7 was asked to record his experiences via a written journal. Report In his first entry, D-7 describes green pastures and a cool breeze. This is followed by a rambling discourse on his feelings of his newfound freedom. The second, third, and fourth entries continue in a similar vein, describing the sights and sounds of what appears to be rural Switzerland, and involving several more asides on various subjects, including freedom, atonement, and forgiveness, each entry being of deteriorating quality. The fifth entry was illegible, and was D7's last. Dr. requested that SCP-691 INV-10 be ceased at 1427 on citing that no more useful information could be yielded. SCP-691 INV-15 Date Expunged Time 1000 Subject D-691-12 Procedure Standard experimental procedure was followed. D-12 was allowed full access to SCP-6910 for 72 hours. After this period, D-12 was denied access to SCP-6910. Daily interviews were conducted. Report D-12's reaction to SCP-6910 was similar to those of D-class personnel in previous investigations. Dr. hypothesized that D-12's reaction to deprivation of SCP-6910 would lead to textbook withdrawal symptoms. Instead, Dr. encountered considerable difficulty when interviewing the subject. D-12 was not responsive to Dr. questions. Other than requests for access to SCP-6910, D-12 was uncommunicative. An MRI scan of D-12's brain showed minimal response to visual, oral, and physical stimuli. An MRI scan taken whilst D-12 was listening to SCP-6910 showed signals consistent with external stimuli, along with a strong reaction originating from the nucleus accumbens. SCP-691 INV-30 Date Expunged Time, 1325. Subject, D-69125. Procedure, standard experimental procedure followed. Dr. requested a D-class subject with a generally high quality of life, a background free of alcohol and drug abuse, and lacking traits generally associated with an addictive personality. Subject D-69125 was acquired via data expunged and subjected to a series of psychological tests and a precursory interview to gauge mental well-being and to confirm background. Subject was to listen to SCP-6910 and was to give a verbal account of their experience. Report No formal report compiled. Transcript of D-69125's account is as follows. 
Translated from... Begin recording. Okay. I hear a man speaking. I can't understand what he's saying. Sounds like English. He's finished now. Do you want me to... Okay. Doing it. There. I hear music. I don't recognize the tune, but can you see this? It's a city. It's how I imagined it would be. Well, until those border security people caught us. Elaborate. You mean you can't see it? It's beautiful. Shining skyscrapers. Everything's just gleaming. This is the my brother told me about in his letter. This isn't like a city back in my country, Doctor. You'll have to see this to believe it. I could stay in a place like this for the rest of my life. Subject begins to hum, ignoring Dr. R's prompts. Tape ends. Again. I want to go back there again. No, I don't want another medical exam. I want that money you promised me. And I want that tape! Recording ends. Item number. SCP-693. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures After Incident 693-A-50, all instances of SCP-693 are to be returned to Regulation Containment Locker 12-CK when not in use. As of Incident 693-E, all instances of SCP-693 have been reclassified as Euclid. As such, each instance of SCP-693 is to be contained in a separate steel containment box. Measuring 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters. Each containment box is still to be stored inside Regulation Containment Locker 12CK. When testing on SCP-693, it is imperative that only hair from the head of the subject be used. At no point should any researcher directly access SCP-693 when it is in an attuned state. All hair should be removed from SCP-693 by the D-Class involved in its testing before it is returned to researchers. Description SCP-693 is a series of 18-centimeter humanoid dolls, each one made from a single strand of string with beads of onyx for eyes. Several instances of SCP-693 have varied forms of clothing from string shirts or pants to cloth headbands and hats. The clothing appears to have no effect on the properties of the doll. New instances of SCP-693 are found with an instruction sheet attached, the contents of which are detailed in Addendum 693-A. SCP-693 reacts as a normal string doll until such a time as a piece of hair from the head of a still-living human being is placed in a loop of its string, a process referred to as attunement. For reactions to having hair from a deceased individual used, please see Addendum 693-B. At this point, the doll begins to move of its own volition, portraying the current actions of whoever it is attuned to. SCP-693 also projects all statements made by said individual, as if it were them. The doll reliably portrays all actions and speech of the attuned individual for a period of nine days. After nine days, the SCP becomes unreliable in both actions and speech. Depending on the color of the base string, the doll will seek to drive its current owner, owner in this case referring to whomever placed the hair in the doll, not the attuned individual, to his death by inaccurately depicting the actions of its attuned individual. Colors and actions are as follows. Red seeks to anger its owner into increasingly violent fits of rage. Blue seeks to send its owner into bouts of depression, leading to suicide. Yellow encourages its owner to engage in acts of unreciprocated lust. Black encourages its owner into increasingly dangerous situations. If an instance of SCP-693 is successful in causing the death of its owner, a new instance of SCP-693 will be found on the owner's body. The Foundation currently has in containment seven red instances, ten blue instances, five yellow instances, and one black instance. Addendum 693-A Transcript of Included Instructions Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker! 
Do you love someone, but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move, their every word. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string on our naughty stalker, and see what you're missing. Another wonderful product, brought to you by The Factory. Addendum 693B, concerning the use of hair from a deceased subject. When hair from a deceased subject is used to attune an instance of SCP-693, the doll no longer passively represents actions taken by the attuned. Instead, SCP-693 purports to be the deceased, acting as a guide to the owner. Again, at the nine-day mark, SCP-693 becomes unreliable, attempting to ensure the death of its owner. Incident 693-A-50 On Director G left two instances of SCP-693 in his office. Director G had recently been the recipient of SCP-50. An hour after leaving his office, the director was summoned back by security due to a smoke alarm being triggered inside his office. Upon entering, the director found SCP-50 on his desk, beside an ashtray which was found to hold the ashes of both instances of SCP-693. The ashes had been crafted to spell, You're Welcome. As of this incident, instances of SCP-693 are not allowed to be left in researchers' personal space. Incident 693-E On Junior Researcher West returned an instance of SCP-693 to the proper containment locker. West had failed to properly remove the hair from the doll. When the locker was next open, all instances of SCP-693 within were gathered around the attuned doll. Said doll had been crucified upside down against the wall of the locker. It is unknown where the SCPs acquired nails. Addendum 693-C after leaving a camera inside the containment locker, it appears that instances of SCP-693 become mobile when not directly observed. While no further outbreaks of violence occurred, unattuned instances of SCP-693 have been shown to go through the actions of the last 30 minutes of the life of their most recent owner. At this point, SCP-693 has been reclassified Euclid and will be locked in separate containers inside the containment locker. Incident 693-P On Researcher Cole attempted to have D-693-4523 attune SCP-693-R-12 using a pubic hair from D-693-43. The SCP began to move as normal, then stopped. It tilted its head downwards for approximately a minute, then raised its head to look up at Researcher Cole. SCP-693 is reported to have said data expunged. At which point, a cleanup crew was sent to the testing chamber. Researcher Cole has been reassigned to medical for psychiatric care, and the two D-Class were terminated ahead of schedule. Addendum 693-D Multiple requests by several mobile task forces have been made to use SCP-693 in conjunction with Anomalous Object Number 1115 to allow for increased spying capabilities against persons of interest. Requests are currently in review. Item Number SCP-699 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-699 is to be kept in a standard 8 meter by 8 meter by 5 meter research bay which was built around the object in the sub-basement of Site-83. The object shall be guarded at all times by two Level 1 personnel who have had a negative reaction to the object, see below, and have shown no interest in opening it. In addition, the artifact is to be kept under video surveillance at all times. Unauthorized attempts to open SCP-699 will be met with severe disciplinary procedures up to and including termination. Any signs of an escape attempt by the contents of SCP-699 must immediately be reported to a Level 4 staff member so that further containment procedures can be initiated. 
Any containment breach is to be met with full force. Description SCP-699 is a clear rectangular case, 2.5 meters by 1.5 meters by 1 meter in size. Engraved on one side is the SCP Foundation Keter symbol and SCP-17591. The artifact appears to be plexiglass, but is in fact a super-dense polymer, much stronger and heavier than any material currently manufactured. The weight of the object is estimated at 24,000 kilograms. SCP-699 shows no seams in its construction and no obvious means of opening it. It has resisted all attempts to open, damage, or acquire a sample of the material it is composed of. Attempts to acquire a small sample of the material so that it can be reproduced are ongoing. The contents of SCP-699 are under investigation and currently in dispute among researchers. The contents of SCP-699 are apparently telepathic and appear differently to most observers, depending upon their desires and psychological state. 90% of observers see the contents in a positive way as something they want to possess or to release. These viewers have reported seeing precious metals, artwork, family members, pets, religious figures, and apparently useful technology contained in SCP-699, and experience a strong desire to open the container. Approximately 9% of observers have a negative reaction to SCP-699's contents and view something frightening or dangerous. Reported contents have included spiders, snakes, demonic humanoids, and other dangerous SCP artifacts, including SCP- These observers do not exhibit any desire to release the contents of SCP-699. Two observers, Dr. and Dr. have observed the same thing when viewing SCP-699. They claim it is entirely empty. It's obviously just a prank. Dr. The contents of SCP-699 are capable of appearing in different forms simultaneously to multiple observers. Other than the form masking telepathy and the transmission of a desire to be released, SCP-699 has not attempted to communicate with anyone. Addendum SCP-699 was first discovered when it appeared in the third floor break room of Site-83 at 3.14 a.m. on 2000. Due to its weight, it immediately crashed through several floors of the site, landing undamaged in the sub-basement. Unfortunately, it caused $1 million in damage to the building, released SCP and SCP was crushed beneath it upon landing. SCP-699 is too heavy to move without causing major structural damage to Site-83, so containment was built around it. A partial report on SCP-699 was found attached to the artifact. This report is for Level 4 and above eyes only. Unfortunately, most of the report was damaged when SCP-699 arrived and is unreadable. Item SCP-17591 Object Class Keter Date of Capture 7-6-2455 Researcher in Charge Dr. B Notes 7-6-2455 SCP-17591 Who Calls Report Damaged Self Report damaged and unreadable. Desires to implement. Report damaged. Referred to as Protocol Z within this document. As this is obviously undesirable and given subjects ability to report damaged. Placed in a standard Keter class containment vessel. Report damaged. Added data expunged to containment protocol to prevent report damaged. After escape or recapture and extensive damage to site ability to influ report damaged protocol z at a distance of 5 report damaged for concern 872455 escape attempts continue 
Subversion of site personnel required termination of Dr. and Researcher B. Report damaged. 2-7-2466. Escape imminent. Experimental containment procedure T to be implemented immediately. We believe the inhabitants of the receiving timeline lack the report damaged and will for many years. Note from the records clerk. I am not about to mess up our database and call this thing SCP-17591. It is SCP-699 until further notice. Note from O5. Do not start tossing recalcitrant or dangerous artifacts into the nearest dimensional portal. It is clearly not safe for many of the items under our control, and there is significant debate among senior staff over whether it should ever be done. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now, and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.